Good afternoon. Not to make a liar out of Christine Wolzinski Vogel. <laughs> it's 12, 16 p.m. Do you know the reason we don't start things at noon? It's because then I wouldn't know to say good noon, good afternoon, good morning. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Marquette University and Eckstein Hall. My name is Joseph Kearney, and it is a great privilege for me as Dean of the Law School to greet you today. I'm going to offer a brief introduction to today's program. To begin, I want to note where we are back in our Lubar Center for an in-person event. During the COVID era, the law school, like the rest of the university, did well on the central front of delivering a high quality education. This was under the leadership of our provost. Even the law school dean has a boss, Kimo Ayun, who is here today. At the same time, we definitely were not able to perform in the same way one of our other important roles as the convener of in-person conversations in this community about the law and society. We did some of that, but only this year, for example, are we able to return with a full complement of, say, distinguished lectures. So today's program very much fulfills the civic education purpose of the Lubar Center. Yet we associate this event with, it is part of a still newer part of Marquette University Law School, our Andrew Center for Restorative Justice. Last December, we announced a really quite extraordinary gift from Louie and Sue Andrew, Joe. Marquette alumni, They're here. right on cue, <laughs> and longtime supporters of the law school. The purpose of the Andrew's gift was both specific and general. To state it in the first way, it is to perpetuate the work of Jeanine Geske perhaps best known as a former justice of the Wisconsin Supreme Court, but around here as a Marquette lawyer and a longtime distinguished professor of law. Louie and Sue are among the legions of great admirers of Janine, and they fulfilled our dreams, some of our prayers, it may be fair to say, to secure this work for the future. We had never given up restorative justice, but we have been especially hard at it since the gift this past December. The first move, the linchpin, was to lure Janine out of retirement while we <laughs> conduct a search for a successor. Wasn't much of a retirement, but uh, so be it. We've been able, through her work over the past nine months and that of our colleagues, to enhance the restorative justice curriculum already this academic year. As I suggested at the beginning of my remarks, the education of future Marquette lawyers is our greatest interest. Yet it's scarcely the only remit or mandate of the Andrew Center for Restorative Justice. We are also pledged to broaden community support and outreach for community, outreach for restorative justice by serving as something of a hub for educating and helping others learn how to use restorative justice approaches. This is civic education as well as legal education. It's a wonderful mix of the Lubar Center and the Andrew Center. And as we reemerge into our more public role with lectures and events such as this, we welcome all of you today. This program is scarcely our first restorative justice gathering. This room alone has hosted many, even back when it was called the appellate courtroom. But it is our first large-scale Andrew Center for Restorative Justice event. So I offer you that welcome, that context, that hint of things to come, and not least, a great thank you to all involved in this. That includes our provost, Dr. Ayun, a strong supporter of our work, who cleared the path for us for the university's prompt creation of a center last December. It includes my colleague, Associate Dean for External Relations, Christine Wolzinski Vogel, who worked for years since Janine's retirement in 2014 to keep the restorative justice flame burning. And it includes 
Janine, back here as Distinguished Professor of Law, but with the wonderful new title of Inaugural Director of the Andrews Center for Restorative Justice, and it includes especially Louie and Sue Andrew, who are here today, along with, I believe, a few other members of the Andrew family. So even before I hand this over to Janine for the introduction of our guest today, a longtime supporter of our restorative justice work, I hope that Louie and Sue might wave so that people know where they are, and then we might give them a warm and most well-deserved <laughs> round of applause. I'm gonna stand for a moment. Um, I don't want to drop this mic. So thank you, Joe, um, and thank you all so much for coming today. Um, this is really exciting. We've been slowly unveiling um, some of the activities of the new Andrew Center, um, and there is much more to come. Um, but we thought we would begin um, on focusing on a survivor of violent crime. Um, restorative justice is often defined as a process, a philosophical approach to address harm. And it is addressed by having truth telling, by learning what happened, learning the impact it's had on people, and then from there finding ways to repair the harm, to try to heal, to try to move forward. Some of the processes involve the perpetrator of offense. Some of them just involve community. Sometimes it's just groups. But um, it's really my privilege to have Mary Kay Belchunas with us today. Um, Mary Kay and I have been friends for a number of years now. And I actually um, was first introduced to Mary Kay in a community circle. I had heard about her um, because you will hear she's had a remarkable path. She's going to share some of that with you. Um, in, in addition to being a speaker and very involved in the community and very involved with a number of law enforcement agencies, she also was chaplain at Children's Hospital for many, many years. And um, I encountered her in a circle on the south side of Milwaukee. We were in a ba church basement, I think, with a number of parolees, with a number of police officers and other community members. And Mary Kay began, everybody was sort of talking about who they were. And I remember what Mary Kay said. She talked about having been a chaplain at Children's Hospital and holding in her arms the parents of some child who'd been shot on the streets of Milwaukee and trying to console them. And then she became one of those mothers. I'll never forget, that's when I learned who Mary Kay was. And since then, We've been able to explore and talk about a lot her journey, um, and she has shared it with many people in many different venues, and you'll get to hear that. But I think it was, it's really important that the voice of survivors are heard, that we understand the ripples of harm. Um, you know, we're watching the news at night, watching trials, watching things going on, and we hear sort of the facts of the case but we don't hear the impact of the case. And that's really, um, I've asked Mary Kay to share with you a little bit about her son, Jay. Um, she's going to introduce him to you so you get to know who he was and what he was doing, and then to talk about what happened that fateful evening and the, what has happened since in terms of her life uh, in the lives of others as, as she travels this journey of healing from the loss of her son. Um, we're going to leave probably about 10 minutes at the end for questions um, and comments, but at this point, I'm gonna sit down. And what I've told Mary Kay, that um, I would like her just to introduce Jay to us. Who was he? Um, who was he in her family? Um, what kind of person he is? I feel like I've no, got to know him and understand who it was that was so violently taken from us in this incident. Mary Kay. Thank you, Janine, <laughs> you thank you, Janine and thank you so much to all of you for being here. Um, when Janine asked me to speak, I thought, you know, Jay died in 2004, and I thought, who wants to hear about what happened 18 years ago? Um, so I appreciate your being here, 
and I consider that a real honor to Jay. Um, my husband and I have three children. All of them Marquette grads, as well as their dad. I'm the only renegade who went to UWM. Um, but I feel like I have spent more time at Marquette than I have at UWM. Um, our firstborn son, John Patrick, uh, we called him Jay from the day he was born, but he was named after his grandparent, his grandfather's. Um, he started his life of service probably when he was 15 or 16. He wanted to join the New Berlin Fire Department. And um, I remember him telling me that he could go and he could help, but he couldn't go into the burning buildings. And I went, um, but after when he turned 18, he said, Mom, now I can go into the burning buildings. And I was like, oh, wonderful. <laughs> um, but as a Marquette student, he was a criminology major. And he began his law enforcement career actually here at Marquette as a public safety officer. He started out, I don't know if they still have them, they called them yellow jackets then, two students who would wear yellow jackets in the evening and escort students around campus. And then he drove the limos and then he became the youngest public safety officer that they had hired at, at least at that point. Um, from there, he was hired by Milwaukee Police Department, and he served as an officer in District 6 for seven years, and um, then applied to the state of Wisconsin Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigation, and was hired as a special agent for them. Um, he loved both firefighting and law enforcement, and um, I think it was, it was his life in addition to um, the love of his life, whom he was engaged to, um, to be married the on September 17, 2005. Unfortunately, that never came to pass because at 1.20 a.m. on October 29th, our phone rang. And I remember clearly Don jumping out of bed and answering the phone and saying, yes, yes, okay, hanging up and turning to me and saying, we need to get dressed. Jay has been hurt. They're taking him to Freighter and they're picking us up in five minutes. We walked out of our house to see a, D a Department of Justice official standing by the, his car and Jay's fiance was already in the car. The official took me aside and he said, I understand that you're a hospital chaplain and so I'm going to tell you, Jay has been shot. That wasn't a shock to me because I assumed that when we got that phone call. Jay had been shot in the abdomen by two men attempting to rob this 34-year-old, and I'll say it, handsome young man, white man walking to his state-issued Camaro Z28 undercover car at the gas station on 37th and Millard. The next seven days, we kept vigil at Freighter Hospital where they gave him fabulous care. And we kept vigil with family members and friends and lots of law enforcement and firefighters. But unfortunately, the injury that he endured um, had pierced his liver and his liver could not recover from it. And so on November 5th, 2004, at 10.50 a.m., the doctor walked out of his room and walked over to us and said, he's brain dead. <clears throat> As a mom, I felt indescribable, indescribable pain and sadness 
and overwhelming grief at the violent, senseless death of our son. As a surviving mom, I also had two other children that I had to worry about. <clears throat> our daughter was married and still is married to a police officer 25 years last week, actually. She grieved her brother's death with the knowledge that her husband's safety was not a given and that had come much closer to her now. And a few years later, she didn't want to celebrate her 35th birthday because she said, I should never be older than Jay ever was. <coughs> Excuse me. Her son, our six-year-old grandson, also feared for his dad's safety and grieved the loss of his Uncle Jay, who was his hero. <coughs> Today, that now grown man is a police officer in, in a suburb of Milwaukee, <clears throat> and I worry about him every day. And I pray for him and all law enforcement officers' safety. <clears throat> Excuse me. Our younger son, Dan, who was almost 11 years younger than Jay, had just started his first job in Chicago after graduation. And so he was living by himself in Chicago away from his immediate family and grieving by himself and with some close friends. But I worried about him because of his distance from us. <clears throat> and knowing that a death of a child can destroy a marriage Don and I grieved in different ways because men and women I knew grieved in different ways from my work at Children's. But we worked together to be united as a couple and to get through this together. Jay's end of watch date every year, which is law enforcement speak for the anniversary of his death, and his birthday are always difficult times. He died on November 5th, and his birthday was January 18th, and that now brackets the holiday season for me. Holidays are different, and for me there's a sadness in it, as well as a joy having five grandchildren that we can celebrate with. I grieved the loss of the person he was and who he would become, and I grieved the loss of him as a very alive, energetic, positive person in our family. Not a day goes by that I don't think of him. Sometimes those thoughts come at very unexpected times. I have been standing at his grave, which is a few blocks away from the fire station where he uh, served, and a fire truck will go speeding by, red lights and siren blaring. And I will be reminded of a, a sticker that his um, firefighter comrades had made after he died. And it says, in memory of our brother, J. Balchunas, forever responding with us. And I look at the fire truck going by, and I think, he's responding with you. He's looking over you and praying for your safety. <clears throat> As Janine mentioned, I was a chaplain at Children's Hospital for 18 years, and I covered the intensive care unit and the emergency center, which is emergency room, which is a trauma center. And I understood hospital procedures and the seriousness of Jay's wounds, though I was still shocked when he died. <clears throat> but I knew about enough about the hospital process and what came after that to navigate it, 
but I was not prepared for the legal system and court proceedings. I felt like we had walked into a foreign land. Same language, but very different culture. I was relieved when the two men who were um, arrested and, and tried and convicted of Jay's death, we were present at every day of three trials, and there were three because the first trial for the shooter was declared a mistrial due to a juror issue. Um, the defendants, as I said, were found guilty. The shooter was given 45 years in prison and 20 years extended supervision, and the accomplice was sentenced to 26 years of confinement and 37 and a half years extended supervision. During the trial and the sentencing, I watched these two young men, ages 19 and 26. Diani, the, the shooter, had no one in the court to support him through two trials and the sentencing. No one ever came for him. And Anthony had a newborn infant daughter who I think he saw for the first time in the courthouse as he was ushered into the courtroom. His parents were not present until his mother was subpoenaed when she was due to testify on his behalf, she was late, and so the court proceedings went on without her. When she did arrive, she, was, she uh, took the stand and did not do his case any favors because the alibi that he gave, she gave for Anthony was refuted by the prosecution very easily. His father did not, that was the only time his mother was in court until the sentencing, and his father was also not in court until the day of sentencing. I watched his mother the day of sentencing, and I thought to myself, but for the grace of God go I. I could be in her position. But I truly believed that I was in a better place because my son was at peace with God <clears throat> and her son was facing years of incarceration. And since that time, as I've studied racism, I've seen, I've also thought the part of, part of that for me was my white privilege because John and I were privileged to be able to give to our children educations and send them to Marquette. In a society that too often accepts an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, my Christian faith and moral values have led me to look at these two men differently. My faith tells me that these men too are of God Somewhere, somehow, that which is of God was lost. They had destroyed their own life in the process of destroying Jay's. Perhaps in the loneliness of prison, I thought they might find the forgiveness and goodness of God which they had lost. So at the sentencing, I brought two Bibles each one had a post-it note on it, and the post-it note, on each note I had written Luke chapter 15 and the verses, and that was the story of the prodigal son and the forgiving father. With the trials behind us, we needed to move on and heal. Restorative justice aims to make justice more healing and more transformative. And as Janine said, I met her when I was in a, 
a restorative justice circle. One of the ways that I tried to heal from the worst time of my entire life. Pope Francis says we are called to be men and women of hope. I chose hope over sadness and despair. My experience informed my ministry at Children's Hospital <clears throat> when I stood with parents at the bedside of their seriously ill and sometimes dying child. <clears throat> Excuse me. I also was invited to join Milwaukee Safe Streets Initiative, which created partnerships with law enforcement, the faith community, and the larger community. And their goal was to fight crime and create hope. It connected me with many community leaders and helped me understand the systems that were in place, the needs that needed that still had to be addressed, and the challenges of funding and collaboration. Mary Kate, would you tell them what happened? Would you tell what, ha what the, the shooting, what happened, how Jay was shot? Oh, sure. Back up. <laughs> Jay was um, working undercover um, actually assisting the FBI the night that he was shot. He was, um, he stopped, it was the second shift of the day. He had agreed to take it for a colleague whose mother was ill and out of state. And so he, I'm sure, was tired and stopped to get a cup of coffee at a gas, the gas station on 37th and Billard. Um, he was not one to drink coffee generally, so that was an odd thing for him to do, so I suspect it was for the caffeine. Um, as he was leaving the gas station and walking back to his car, he was approached by um, Deani Reynolds and Anthony Bolden, and Deani had a gun. Anthony walked behind Jay and uh, felt for his wallet. Their intention was to rob him, but uh, he, when he felt for his wallet, he felt Jay's gun, and he said to Anthony or to Gianni, "Dude's got a gun," and Gianni shot him. Jay's bulletproof vest, which he promised me he would always wear when he became a law enforcement officer was on the seat of his car because he hadn't gotten to where he was going yet. Um, <clears throat> we, we are told that he was, he radioed his partner and within a minute or two, his partner was at his side holding him until the ambulance came. <clears throat> At some time later, I met the emergency room physician who worked on Jay, and he told me that Jay was as close to death as he could be when he arrived at the emergency room. Um, I just thought the background of... Sorry. <laughs> I sometimes take for granted, because uh, I've been haven't given a talk on Jay in a long time, so I'm trying to remember what needs to go into it. So Mary Kay, I'm gonna ask you a few questions. Um, so you, you, first of all, um, I was at an event where you were honored and I heard a police officer talk about what you said at Jay's funeral. Would you be willing to share what you told wow. this room full of officers, or church full of officers? Um, a little background on that. The, uh, Jay's pastor and my pastor was my professor when I studied at the seminary. And, um, and he was also my spiritual director. And so he knew me fairly well. 
Um, I asked him if I could give the homily at Jay's funeral mass, and so he agreed. And so I can't remember a lot of it, but I know that I said to this church that was overflowing with law enforcement and firefighters and friends, um, one of the things that I challenged them to do was to pray for the safety of all of the, every time they hear a siren, pray for the safety of those who are responding. Um, and, and, you know, this, this particular officer who, who nominated me for that honor heard in, in my homily words of forgiveness. I can't tell you exactly what those were. At the time, I was probably struggling with it. Um, but however I said it, it came across to him. Well, it really touched him. I know that he had remarked that to have the mother of an officer who was killed to be t talking in terms of forgiveness or trying to find a path to forgiveness um, took an incredible act of courage and bravery on your part. Um, so you have um, <clears throat> traveled many different paths um, uh, in restorative justice um, since Jay's death, um, including a whole new educational field, um, work with law enforcement. Um, you continue to do chaplaincy for police departments um, and have gone to prison with us. Could you talk about those a little bit and how that fits into your, your road of, of trying to find a path towards healing? Um. I, at that, when Jay was killed, I had already been um, the chaplain for the New Berlin Police Department for a couple of years. And um, the, actually, the support I received, both Don and I received from New Berlin was um, overwhelming. I mean, they, from the time that Jay's death notice was in the paper until after his funeral. There was a, an undercover car sitting down the street from our house, watching our house. Um, they were there for us. For um, Jay was buried at the uh, Holy Apostle Cemetery in New Berlin. They were there for us. Um, directing traffic and, and making sure that everything went smoothly. And afterwards, they have, they have always been very supportive of us. Um, I am sure that we could pick up the phone and call and, and they would be there for us. And I think that's just who they are as an, as a, an agency. Anybody pick up the phone and call and they will be there for them. Um, also, um, the Department of Justice. Jay was a, a special agent for, um, and assigned to, assigned to HIDA, the High Intensity Drug Trafficking Agency. And as such, he was sworn in as a task force officer for the DEA. Um, the DEA has been it just, uh, if I say amazing to us, that's an understatement. Every year they have a, a ceremony at National Police Week in Washington, D.C., and they invite us to it. They remember every person who was on their memorial wall um, at a ceremony, and they um, name every person, regardless of whether it was a special agent, a task force officer, or some of their office staff who, who were killed in the Oklahoma City bombing. Um, they invite us to that every year. Um, we have lunch in the director's office, but um, they are there for us as well. And I have been honored to be asked to give the invocation at that ceremony the last several years. 
Um, so different law enforcement agencies have been just very good to us. That's just two examples. Um, and, and a few years ago, I was asked to be one of the chaplains for the Department of Justice Division of Criminal Investigation in Wisconsin, which is the agency that Jay worked for. There are a number of us who are chaplains for, for their agency throughout the state. And your PhD and your work on reentry right now and your time in the prison, what has that meant to you? You're asking me to brag. I don't like doing that. Um, I'm pulling it out of her. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I remember saying to Jay before, some weeks before he was shot, I'm thinking of going back and getting my PhD. And he encouraged me. And uh, so I did the following year. I think I started in 2006, actually, um, at Cardinal Stritch. And um, Cardinal Stritch has a, a PhD program in leadership that you can kind of design your own dissertation around what you're working on. Well, for me, I, I had to do it the hard way. I didn't do something on chaplaincy, which I knew a fair amount about. But I wanted to do it on violent crime reduction initiatives. And so, um, so, so I was basically doing it on something I knew nothing about. And uh, met Janine, Janine and Bill Lipscomb and a number of people who really were, were instrumental in introducing me to um, other people, introducing me to different um, meetings that I should attend, and just giving me a lot of support and encouragement to do that. Um, and I, I think, it, I can't remember when I first went to the prison, but um, I had a need to see where Anthony Bolden lived. Um, and, and I had been told that if you stretch out your arms, that's how big, that's how big the cell is, which I found amazing. Um, and so I went with Janine with a group, um, one of your restorative justice groups, to uh, visit Green Bay. And it was a three-day program that Janine ran. And she had promised me ahead of time that I would not run into Anthony Bolden. I took a, a tour that was given. Um, it was optional. Um, and did see that, in fact, if I do this, I could probably touch both walls, maybe a little. Which was sad. I mean, it saddened me to know where he lived. Um, and since then, I wrote him a letter. And, um, and received a lengthy letter in response. And the letter went through Janine. Janine went and visited him. Maybe you want to say a little bit about that? Um, <clears throat> Anthony Bolden is doing extremely well in prison. Um, he has, doesn't have any violations. That baby that he saw held up in the, um, in the courtroom um, is somebody that he's now maintained a very long relationship with. That's unusual because he had not had a chance to have a relationship with her. And they communicate regularly, and he's very, very proud of the accomplishments she's had and and uh, her mother brings her from time to time to visit but they manage to write back and forth and have lots of contact um anthony bolden do you mind me saying no, where his ahead. position is um ha still maintains his innocence he he maintains that he was not there um at the shooting um, which is problematic for a, a victim offender dialogue because when there's a denial it becomes more complicated. <clears throat> um, and um, But that being said, he has been, in my view, very empathetic towards Mary Kay and, and the loss of Jay. Um, 
He, um, he also had other criminal convictions and um, he's gonna be serving a long time because he, um, he had these other charges. But as I said, he, you know, he remembers the Bible that you gave him and he's been very active in church group in the prison and sings in the choir and um, is sort of a model prisoner in terms of his behavior in the prison. So um, we have had periodic contact with him, but it's kind of been at that juncture and we've kind of left it there for the time being because of the denial of responsibility, so. And Deani Reynolds I have not had contact with. And you have not had interest in that. And I have not had interest in that. He had committed other homicides, if I remember right. He is serving, um, yes. In fact, at, at the sentencing for Deani Reynolds, a, a woman came up to me afterward, gave me a hug and said, I'm sorry your son had to die for my son's killer to be found. Um, and she and I kept contact for a while, and I've, I've, lost, I've lost contact with her, but um, I did go to, the, to um, the sentencing for him when he was tried for the, um, the murder of her son, who was standing at a bus stop, if I remember correctly, on North Avenue and Deani Reynolds and someone else came out of the bushes and in an altercation he was shot. I think he tried to run and they shot him. Let me ask you one more question um, and then in a few minutes I wanna open up questions from the audience, but um, tell me, um, you've got, you become involved in a reentry program could you talk about that a little bit and why you made that decision and what you see, what you see in that program? Um, I, I've started just kind of being a, a listener in their meeting, in the Milwaukee reentry program um, meetings. And my interest in that is because I think about these young men and women who are coming out of the prison system and and wondering what resources they have. Um, and it, it actually came up in a, in a course I was taking at my parish on racial justice. And we were reading a chapter about, um, actually, the, the um, imbalance of those of different races who are incarcerated. Uh, and and in this book, it said there is no, there are no services for reentry, and I thought, oh, that can't be right. So I s called a few people to find out what was going on, and discovered that yes, there is a reentry program in Milwaukee County, and that um, they are helped with housing and they are helped with employment and, and some other things, and I just felt that that was so important so that we could lessen the, the rate of recidivism. Um, if I were coming, and I always think to myself, if that were me, if I were coming out of prison with maybe a high school education, maybe more, um, and nowhere to go, no, no future, no job, I would lose hope in life. And I think that some of the folks coming out of prison have a lot to offer, especially because they have, they have experienced real hardship. One of the things I just wanted to add, so you have context. Um, <laughs> while we were running the Restorative Justice Initiative, we did, and I don't know how many exactly, but I would guess somewhere between 15 and 20 homicide cases where we worked with surviving family members who wanted to meet face-to-face -face 
with the perpetrators of those crimes. Um, as I indicated, generally the rule is if an offender is not taking responsibility or, do, you know, or maintains his innocence, uh, we don't facilitate it. But all, uh, in 15 to 20, we've successfully done those. And uh, on a couple of cases, the uh, victim survivors have advocated for release on parole five, 10, 15 years down the road. Um, I just received a new case last week um, where a mother's son was murdered, her, her teenage son, and um, she has interest in meeting the individual who pulled the trigger. So I, when I was a judge, I never thought that people would want to do that, and I was wrong. Uh, we will continue to do that with students as well as work on other projects. Um, some of the things we are ongoing, I just wanted you to know, is that we have um, a, a general agreement, we don't have the specifics yet, that we're going to develop a relationship with the Milwaukee Police Department to provide um, training at the training academy for officers on restorative justice um, and hopefully expose them to some circles and then work through one of the precincts um, with the officers and see ways of whether they want to do internal restorative justice because there's need for that too, the amount of trauma that the officers are facing and Mary Kay is very well aware of that or whether they want a more restorative justice with the community. Um, we are also working with the Department of Corrections trying to restart our prison program. I've got a meeting next week with a number of officials from, from corrections. We are going to have students placed in different places around the community doing restorative justice work. We're being called upon on some big issues even on campus to get involved and, and we're just in the process of redeveloping the center and, and doing the um, next steps. The one thing I do want to draw your attention for, and you'll get a mailing on it, we're going to do a really significant conference, and I think it's March, where's Christine, is she here? March, March, 9th. March 9th and 10th, thank you. Um, and it's going to be completely on the role of Native Americans, indigenous people in restorative justice and how they're using process, restorative processes to address some of the issues that are facing um, the, um, the tribes, including boarding school issues and other related issues in human trafficking. We're working with all the tribes in Wisconsin, um, and we're really having the, the um, Indians help drive the agenda. Um, a lot of processes in restorative justice come from indigenous people, um, First Nation in Canada, Maori tribe in New Zealand, and many other places. And so we're going to just try to, to highlight and give people an opportunity to sort of see where those values and traditions come from. So that'll be a pretty exciting conference. Now, I'd like to open it up for any questions. If people have questions, um, we've got... Uh, Gonna run the mic? Yes. Okay. Anybody have questions either of Mary Kay or me? Yes, Alex. Um, thank you for sharing so much of your story with us. And You're I think welcome. one thing that excites people about restorative justice um, and can be challenging is that it's a real shift. It's a countercultural response, right, to violent crime in this case. So as I listen to you, I hear two things that helped you make that shift. One is empathy, because you said a number of times, you know, thinking, imagining yourself in the other person's shoes. And the other was your Christian faith. So my question is, is that accurate? And then if you want to elaborate on either of those. Um, yes, it's accurate. Uh, my, my background is social work and, and chaplain, uh, theology, specifically pastoral care. And, and so I have, I have to say that, 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 you know, part of that is my training. Um, and, and I grew up in a family that my mom was in a wheelchair. And so from horrible rheumatoid arthritis, and so I, I learned that everything wasn't, you know, beaver cleaver. It was, we, you know, we, 
we took care of my mom and she was a wonder. She was probably my biggest model of caring and thoughtfulness. Um, because even though she was in a wheelchair, she would remember other people and she would reach out to them and she knew birthdays and had gifts for them and, um, and was just a, a very kind and thoughtful Christian lady. Other questions? Sure. Yeah, kind of to piggyback off Alex's question. Um, and maybe this is a bit too personal, but have you, have you been able to completely forgive those two men? Can you hear the question? No. The question is whether, uh, he said it may be too personal, but have you been able to completely forgive the two men? I believe I have forgiven Anthony. Um, and when I think about Diani, and no, I have not reached out to him, but I've been thinking about it 18 years later. Um, when I think about Diani, I have to remember that he came from a family where he never, and I learned this from Derek Nunnally from the Journal Sentinel who interviewed his mom. He came from a family that had, he never knew his dad. His brother is also in prison for murder. Um, and he said, when I interviewed his mom at her home, she did not have any pictures of either of them. But she works in, a, I think she worked in a daycare. She had pictures of the children that she worked with, but not of her own sons. So I guess I, I can understand that if you grow up in a family where you're not taught and you're not witnessing empathy or kindness or responsibility, you turn to what you feel you can control. And in that respect, I can understand it. I don't know that I have forgiven him for shooting Jay, but I can understand how he had turned to a life of crime. And maybe someday I'll, I'll be yes. able to. Can you give us a description of the protocol for restorative justice? Is there a process that is followed? Well, restorative justice is a philosophical approach, which means that there are different processes. But if you're talking about a victim-offender dialogue in crimes of severe violence, so that's sort of what we were focusing on, there is a protocol um, that those of us who do this work around the country and around the world, frankly, um, we generally, the United States requires that it be victim requested, so, or survivor requested. So um, somebody who's committed a crime, generally a serious crime, cannot request a meeting because the potential is to re-victimize a survivor by calling them up and say, you know, the guy who did this would like to meet with you. Um, and so, but in Europe they do it, so it, it's, it's a different approach. Um, we prepare the survivor and find out why it is he or she wants to meet with the victim, what are their objectives. Often it's a combination of letting them know the harm that they've caused. Sometimes, I mean, like these offenders did not don't know Jay. They don't know anything about him. So to get to know him, often a picture like this is between, on a table between the, the victim or the survivor and the offender when we have these meetings so they could actually see who that person is that they killed or that they hurt. Um, and, but we work with the victim, and then it's voluntary on the offender's part. If they say no, that's the end of it. Uh, most uh, long-term incarcerated offenders say yes. Um, it's a process that takes six months to two years. We spend a lot of time on prep with both of them before we put them together. I always say we want to avoid a Jerry Springer moment. Um, and, uh, and it's funny, but it's not funny. You know, we don't want trauma 
for anybody else. And the facilitator's role is to be a neutral there and try to provide a safe environment for these discussions. But if you're doing circle work or other kinds of work, there is always a preparation and the, the facilitator always tries to be the neutral and trying to facilitate dialogue among people. Maybe a couple more questions. Yes. Can you push the, the mic thing? Yeah, that would help. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, when I was in my 20s, uh, we lived in an east side apartment that was broken into. And we, you know, everything was taken. Um, everything out of our dresser drawers, everything was on the floor. They didn't even the... But anyway, they didn't... And I got a call that I was for it for Israel Killers, and I said, well, and so I went down and um, there's this young man. Oh, yes, you, you do. Know. Anyway, and uh, he had been on drugs. And he had done a series of break-ins. Who broke into our apartment a few years before, and um, here I was. I had a new house. I had a new baby. Um, he had a wife and a baby who Puerto Rico. By the time this trial was over, I wanted to. You know, if I could give them some money, I think everybody should look at everybody as a victim. It's very, I, I, often people don't understand the trauma of being a survivor of a crime. And what may look, at, you know, burglary is a perfect example of that. If we look at the statute, it says entry of a building with intent to take property. I mean, that's the, but that's not the harm that's done. And the harm is the psychological harm, the sense of safety, the fear, and all, all that wraps up in it. And, and so to do a victim offender dialogue in those cases when it's appropriate has really deep meaning. I, had, I did one with a woman I knew who had a house that was burglarized and the offender was in prison and he had stolen her grandmother's jewelry and she kept crying during the meeting and he said, I'll pay you back, I'll pay you back. And she said, you don't understand, you can't pay me back. You took so much from me. And um, he said, I don't want to be the source of your tears. And I, I just remember this sort of being poetic. And what was interesting is that after that meeting, <clears throat> and they don't earn very much in prison. I mean, it's like 25 cents an hour or something. Um, she started getting a check for $10 every month from him. And the point was that not that she was getting $10, but he finally understood the depth of the harm, and she was feeling so much better. One, she was no longer fearing him that she had met him, but secondly, that he clearly understood that he had done great harm, and the little bit he could do would make a difference for her. But I'm sorry about your experience, and, and there is a lot of trauma, and, and the court system cannot handle it. That's not a place for that to be addressed, so restorative justice is a way to be able to do this. To lose it, I mean, he just ruined his life. So yeah. I feel that you know restorative justice is important. Yeah. One other time for one more question. Just loud. Can push. Oh. <laughs> keep pushing. You got to keep your finger down on it. So. Pretty. I think I'll just try to project. That's, that's okay. good. That's good. <laughs> Um, thank you both so much for being here and for sharing. Um, in my practice, I've focused on representing survivors of violent crimes. And like you said, it does seem like when they first encounter the legal system, it's often quite overwhelming and difficult to navigate. Um, and my question is, um, uh, what kind of efforts exist to um, introduce the concept of restorative justice to victim survivors so that it sounds like there um, are these opportunities to connect into circles and I wonder how they learn about it so that they can have that opportunity. Well they learn about it through different ways I can tell you um, a lot of the work that we've done over the last 15 years while we had the program here were because part of it is I, I give about 
six speeches a month, and uh, you know, it's sort of word of mouth. The uh, Department of Corrections has a victim services, and if somebody makes inquiry there, you know, they will refer people either to us or to the University of Wisconsin Madison, who which also has a program. Um, they. We had an article a number of years ago in a newsletter that went to survivors, and it, um, the problem is that there aren't enough people doing the work, um, and and you know it's not it's not a profession that you decide to earn your living doing, um, and um, you know we're, that's why we're so fortunate that the Andrews have now dedicated this center, and I'm hoping that among other things we're going to be able to train people to be able to do victim offender dialogues or circles and then to support them while they're doing that work. Um, and so we're gonna be here permanently. And so I think that there's a real future that, that Marquette's gonna be able to make a difference not only statewide but nationally. So it's one minute late and we started one minute late, so it's exactly an hour. <laughs> thank, thank you so much for coming, thank you. Thank you, Mary Kay. Thank you.